My name is Helena. I've got a sister. She's called Maggie and she's four years right now. And she has a red syndrome. She's very smart. Even if she can't tell you something, you can see it in her eyes and I can see that she's really understanding a lot. If something is bothering her, she's not able to tell me about it, tell her mom about it. So it's just her and herself all the time. Brett syndrome is a disorder that essentially uh, robs children of their abilities. So most cases of Rett syndrome are caused by mistakes in a gene called methyl CPG binding protein 2 or MECP2. There are over 500 different potential mistakes in the MECP2 gene. Uh, but typically uh, a girl will um, be born following a normal pregnancy, a normal delivery. Um, early development will be fine but from about six months or so, the, uh, the baby will start to lose skills that she had attained. So uh, she will lose um, purposeful hand movements. Uh, she will um, lose um, the uh, ability to communicate. I'm here to tell you a story. Like many stories, it begins with there once was. What makes this story special is that you are all involved. He lays in your hands to create the ending of this story. And this story deserves a happy one. I love him, I love him, I love him. And when he goes, I follow, I follow, I follow, I will follow him. It's Kathy, and uh, my daughter Samantha has Rett syndrome. And uh, she was diagnosed when she was 22 months, and she's now 20. It's always times, even you know, 20 years down the track, that you still have moments because you know I'll never see her get married, or she'll never have children, and, and I see things that my friends' children are doing, and you know, graduating from uni, and, and these sorts of things that she's not going to get to. Then you see her and a happy smile, and and she's happy and she makes other people happy. So I guess you take something from that and that gets you through the, the hard times. And it's, it's really hard to put yourself in that place to know that because we want to do something, we just don't do it. And, to, and I try and explain to her brothers sometimes that you know, they complain about this or that or she's doing this. I say, yeah, but if you want to get up and get something to eat, you just get up and get something to eat. If you want to change the channel, you change the channel. But she gets fed what's put in front of her and she gets to watch what's turned on for the TV and it's very difficult for her to make a comment that she doesn't want to do that. She's usually pretty happy, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my name is Cecilia Coleman and this is my daughter Olivia Rowe. My name is Charles Rowe and I am Olivia's father. I can remember going out with friends and their kids and there would be planes in the sky. And little kids, they were what, you know, a year old, less than a year old. They're all sort of pointing up and looking at the planes in the sky and, and pointing. And she didn't do that. She just had no concept of being able to point or look and focus at things. Uh, you know, most people just thought that she was a little bit delayed, but I just, I just had this spidey sense of something that more than just a delay. She likes music, although she can't use her hands the way that other children would use her hands. She taps with her feet, or she'll hit a drum with her feet. She loves the water, she loves swimming. Uh, she sinks like a rock, but if you put a, a noodle under her, she'll she her. just goes everywhere, and, and, and that's probably her most favorite activity. We have one really good friend, and she's a really good friend, um, but she can't watch Olivia eat. The tricky thing is these girls, their eyes wander a whole lot. And so you really have to pay very close attention to see when she focuses enough on one object that, okay, she has chosen that object. So we'll have pictures of 
milk or cereal or hamburger or pizza, whatever it is. Um, and so hopefully you know, you'll have some of those things for her to choose from on the table. So we'll ask a so question want, and she'll look at it. Yeah, so do you want something to drink? And then hopefully she'll look at the picture of the milk and then we can give her something to drink. Great job. Now can you find the horse? Of course. Now find the lion. You can just tell by her, her facial expression, her body language that she's frustrated or that she'd like to say something, but it's like she doesn't know how to do it. Uh, yeah, she sometimes it comes across as being cross, so she'll be angry, or she'll be, that frustration will manifest itself in some sort of a act, or uh, she can shout, or, or even cry. Well, sad and happy have to do things, so when she's hungry, she gets angry. When she's sad, you know, there are times where things will be going swimmingly and then just see this tear roll down the face. And I think it might be just a sad frustration that she knows she can't communicate everything that she wants to. But then again, there are times where she'll actually do something about it. For example, if, she's, if she really wants to get up, I'll watch her start putting her hands down and start trying to do this. It's like, okay. Uh, but to me, that's a form of communicating. And she has uh, injuries that other children have when they do sport. Uh, but hers, her sport wasn't, you know, running down the field, you know, trying to compete for a, another goal. Hers was just trying to get from that chair over here. Although the brain can't function the same way a normal uh, child would, would remember things, it still functions. And I think that's the part about Rett syndrome that most people don't understand. Olivia's brain works fine, but it's, the brain isn't the issue. It's how the synapses are then fired into the brain. And that is the MECP2 protein's job. And that MECP2 protein is mutated. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. I think um, the prospects for Rett syndrome over the next five or ten years is actually really pretty exciting in terms of potential therapy. I, I would say that there is hope. The work done by Adrian Bird and then the work done by others focusing in on specific aspects of the biology of Rett syndrome um, really have opened up the opportunities to be able to design um, and test targeted specific therapies for children with Rett syndrome. So I think the science behind understanding RET is uh, far more advanced than a lot of neurological symptoms. They know so much more about RET than autism and some other things. And so I, I do believe the literature when it says that if they can unlock the mystery of RET, that will open the door to unlocking the mysteries of a whole host of other neurological symptoms. It, it does sort of seem to be a bit of a Rosetta Stone. And I think they are closer we got lucky with Rett syndrome um, as far as you know, uh, scientists being able to actually identify what caused it and that's a needle in a haystack um, so we're hopeful that you know they can find that other couple of needles that are also put in a bigger haystack. I mean Samantha was diagnosed with Rett when she was two and she's 20 so 18 years but in the first year or so of her diagnosis they found the genes and they've just made so much progress in what would be genetically a, a short period of time. I mean I know it's, it's a long time still, it's her lifetime so far but it's amazing what they've found out so far so if they can get that far so quickly with more money and more research it's just maybe there was a cure out there for all those sufferers. It's just amazing to think that it, it's possible and there's some very smart people they just need the money to to do it, to do the work, and there's all these smiling faces if you get the word out of those, 
those girls and boys then just imagine how that would feel. The Red Syndrome Research Trust are researching right now to um, activate the second X chromosome because they have a healthy one and a mutated one or affected one and they are trying to switch the second one on. At that, at that point those girls would have a completely healthy body. I always imagine it that, do you know when you are afraid and then your throat like kind of swallows so yeah. that you are not able to breathe that good or for example I'm afraid of a small room so that I'm not able to move or to get out. I imagine it to be like that. It would be like a huge relief just to open the door, you know, just to be free, like to be a normal, a healthy person. I, I, you know, I would like to think that in my lifetime that there will be effective treatments available. Yeah. So far the uh, preliminary studies for at least some of these trials are looking quite promising. Obtaining research funding from federal government agencies is extremely difficult. Funding uh, to pr can be able to continue Red Syndrome research is very much reliant on donations and, and philanthropic um, donations. It's certainly an area that we uh, are very keen to promote um, in the hope that ultimately the work that's done will lead to cures for Red Syndrome. There once was a girl who that could dance with her hands. There once was a girl that could talk with her eyes. There once was a girl that should be able to dance with her feet and to talk with her voice. With your help, she will.